All right, I want to address this question uh, people have asked, and I've asked, is Jesus God Almighty? Is Jesus the Father? And then, of course, uh, when you say yes, then you say, well, why does Jesus pray to the Father? And all that sort of stuff. So, uh, let's clarify, first of all, that Jesus is God Almighty. That this should be there should be no mistake about this. All right. So if we just go, God was oops, manifest it. Nope, that's not it. Manifest in the flesh. Now the important thing here is, you have to believe in Jesus. If you don't believe in Jesus, you might as well believe that Scooby Doo is God Almighty. It doesn't matter. You're going to hell anyway. The only thing that matters is that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And without that, you're not going to have any understanding. And none of this even matters. Uh, uh, nothing matters. And this does matter, but it, it doesn't matter in the sense that, well, if you're not saved and you think you understand this, it doesn't matter because you're not saved. You have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Critically important, right? So... Um, the one verse I like to go to is without controversy great is the mystery of godliness well I thought that was in the Bible maybe I imagine that and without controversy great is the mystery of godliness God was manifest in the flesh justified in the spirits or in the spirit excuse me seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Alright, so let's go to Isaiah oh, what is that? What verse am I thinking of? Um, I want to show that <clears throat> that it's the God of the Old Testament is God of the New Testament, Jesus is God, so because he's God in the New Testament, he's also God in the Old Testament. Alright, makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Isaiah 43 verse 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Who said that? It's only one possible answer to that and it's Jesus right so we go we can go to um, we can go to um, oh we could oh gee there's so many that we could go to uh, I want to go to Matthew 18 if you don't mind uh, I just want to sort of or what a 16 excuse me I don't even, don't even know all right so Jesus asked his disciples whom do men say that I am and some say Elias and the prophet and Jeremiah and but whom say ye that I am and Simon Peter says thou art the Christ the son of the living God so him so Jesus being the Christ he's the Savior the Son of the Living God and make that makes him equal with God and then we can go to Revelation the Alpha and Omega and see that uh, okay let me read it I am Alpha and Omega the beginning and the ending saith the Lord. Who's the Lord? I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior, saith the Lord. Well, the Lord is Jesus. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Shouldn't be crystal clear that Jesus Christ is God Almighty. Alright, so how do you explain 
that uh, Jesus prays to to the Father. So, what we, that verse we just read about great is the mystery of godliness. So, without controversy, great is the mystery of God. There's no doubting about it. No, no make, make mistake. No, no wiggling around. It's a great controversy. It's a great mystery, excuse me. I apologize. It's a great mystery. So it's a mystery. So we can't fully wrap our brains around it. But uh, so God is manifest in the flesh. So the way that I view it is that Jesus was, God was manifest in the flesh in the form of baby Jesus. So he took on flesh like we are in the flesh. And that he lived the perfect example for us to live by. And he led the way to everlasting life by ultimately giving up his life and being uh, the perfect sacrifice to God for our sins and then uh, being killed and then uh, raising or resurrecting back to life and ascending to heaven and so he's leading the way for us and so that's how I, so when he prays to the father he's in the flesh like we are in the flesh right now so like when we pray to God we we're not praying to another person in the flesh we're praying to God Almighty that's I don't know that's how I look at it uh, so there's no issue when Jesus is praying to the Father he's setting the example he's showing us the way and everything every walk of his life when he was in the flesh he was perfect all the way. He's the only one that's perfect, and nobody has come close to him. But he he showed us the way. He's shown us the way. And if we believe in him, we follow him, we will have, even now, have everlasting life. All right, so uh, let's, I want to go here. Uh, this gentleman here, he's doing this goofy 20 part, what is that, 26 or 16, whatever, I don't know, I don't know, Roman numerals, but anyways, he's uh, trying to say that Jesus Christ reigns a thousand years, and then <clears throat> apparently there's, you know, people walking around with their heads cut off during this time, and zombies walking around, and uh, Christians are, so-called Christians are, you know, Raining, sick in their finger, ruling over the zombies. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, really, it's nonsensical. But uh, you know, and obviously he's getting he's getting this from false teaching. But he brings up an interesting question here, or not not really a question, but he should be asking this question if I could find it. Uh, he left four walls they call church in 2020 and never looked back. All right, all right there. And here it is. At end of 1,000 years, Jesus actually gives the power back to God, the Father, who gave it to God may be all in all. Who gave it that God may be all. Jesus it's that that's nonsensical all by itself. Jesus being God doesn't give the power back to nobody. The only way you could look at this is if Jesus is God Almighty and God the Father is not God Almighty. As if Jesus it implies that Jesus is not God the Father. That's the issue, right? So we can go back to Isaiah and see that Jesus is indeed the Holy Father. I mean, I just showed you. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. 
Isaiah 9, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. All right, so Jesus is the Father. It's all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the New Testament. So I want to show you another verse. When I believe, uh, oh, I'm going to have to guess now. Was it Thomas? Somebody asked Jesus, show us the Father. Oh, I'm going to have to probably put that in. Show us the Father. Show us the Father. Not that any man has seen the Father, save he which is of God, he has seen the Father. I speak that which I have seen with my Father, and you do that which you have seen in your Father, the devil. If he had known me, you should have known my Father also, and henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. So that's right there. Let's open that up. Let's take a look, see. Where's this at here? Was it Philip? What did I say earlier? Thomas? Doesn't matter. Who cares? So, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Phil. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. It's a great question, or a great, uh, you know, it's a great conversation they're having. Really. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then? Show us the Father. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me. He does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Okay, so anyways, the, the point being that he, the Father is dwelling in him. So think about this. When you are saved, when you are born of God, you have God dwelling in you. And you dwell in, you are in God. You are a new creature. So he again, he's showing us the way, right? He's leading the way for us even now. All right, and then <clears throat> I want to show you something even more incredible, in my opinion. And Jesus is the Son, and He's the Father. And you know, there seems to be some. A lot of people discussing that and wondering that and questioning that, but it's it's important, in my opinion, that we understand that Jesus is also the Holy Ghost. He is the Son, the Father, and the Spirit. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. He's talking about the Holy Ghost which is the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send. He will teach you all things, bring all things to remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. <clears throat> so we can go to um, numerous verses, I guess. But Oops, not that, not that. There it is. Or was it that? Heck, I don't know. Being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So that's when it says being confident that he which has begun a good work in you, that's the Holy Ghost that is in you, that's the Spirit of God 
that is in you, and that's the comforter that Jesus is talking about that is in you. You are a new creature. You're born of God, right? But when the comfort is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And let's go back to... Um, i got to think of which one it is. Oh, let's go here. I got to think. You'll have to forgive me. I'm still on my second cup of coffee. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to do it this way, I think. Doing it the hard way. Could have done it the easier way. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Okay, it is 14. All right, so we'll go back to 14. And we'll find that word comforter right there. And I, like I read, he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. It's talking about the, the Spirit of God. And he says, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. So without faith, you cannot receive the Spirit of truth. It's, it's a, incredible. It really is. It's unbelievable. It's so amazing that until you believe your eyes are blinded, you have a veil over your heart and you cannot see, you cannot understand the Word of God. But when you do believe, when you have faith, the veil is lifted and you start to see all these things you never saw before. It's amazing. It really is. And so, uh, Jesus here is talking about uh, sending the, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, to those that are born of God. When you are born of God, that's you're receiving the Holy Ghost. God dwells in you, and you dwell in God. And he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. He's not saying it will come to you. He's saying I will come to you. So Jesus being the comforter and the spirit of truth and the Holy Ghost. It's all the same thing. And right there. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So when you are born of God, the veil is lifted, and all these things in the Bible and how it relates to the world around you and, and in your life, everything starts to open up and you start to see. Now, you're not going to know everything right away. You're like a little baby and you're, you're going to grow. Just like when you were born from your mother's womb, you didn't know everything. You lived and learned. So also... When you are born of God, you grow, you live and learn, but you're learning spiritual things now rather than just the things, the physical things around you. It's much more amazing, much more incredible. And so, anyways, I hope that helps somebody. Man, I'm telling you, God, God is um, amazing, really. And... Jesus is God Almighty. He's the Father. He's the Son. He's the Holy Ghost. And um, so, of course, it's a great mystery because we can't wrap our heads around it. It would be foolish to think that we are all-knowing. And there's a lot of people out there that sit on their big fat thrones thinking they know it all. And... 
the fact is we don't know it all and we can't know it all but God does know it all God's the one that made us of course he knows it all right so I want to share that with you I think uh, there's a lot of he says he he left the church in 2020 uh, whatever church he was going to oh that's great man that's great I mean if you look I'm one of those these persons that that'll tell you if your pastor if you're going to a church and that preacher is saying he's holding up a collection plate and he's proclaiming in front of God and everybody that that collection plate is Jesus I'm gonna tell you to get out the get the hell out of that church get away from it what <laughs> it, look it's important to fellowship and to be with um, not and to not be unequally yoked and it's important to be around other people that are saved it's important to have those influences in your life no question about it but you don't need to be trapped inside of a building with the devil ain't no way in hell you're gonna convince me otherwise Right? And, and it's not like there are true churches all over everywhere I can testify to that living in a small town and I've been to both churches and I can't say that, that there's something wrong there's something very very wrong and I want to get into all that but I don't blame anybody at all for leaving they're a church that they believe is absolutely corrupt. Now, I don't expect anybody to be perfect. But a church ought to uh, be open and listen and have the conversations with the congregation. The people that come to church ought to be able to have conversation with the preacher and discussion. And the preacher should never exert his authority and should never hold the attitude that he knows more than the people and I mean it's really the, almost the complete opposite is happening everywhere I've been to and I don't know I guess that's natural for you know but consider and reason with one another and, and I just don't it's I, I've not seen that I, for whatever reason the people that I've talked to they don't want to sit down and reason and have a dialogue and a discussion about what the Bible actually says and what they are teaching and it's it's unfortunate because it makes it really hard for a new Christian who has lots of questions to come to a preacher and a teacher and say hey what about this and what about that and the preacher gives the standard answer that they probably got from a textbook and not showing the true wisdom from out of the Bible and of course that's another issue the but if you're teaching from a corrupt Bible you can't honestly say that's the Word of God because if you're like NIV for example you cannot honestly say the NIV is the Word of God you can't do it man there's a problem even a child can see this problem it's a big problem it's a big 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 deal it's not a small foo-foo and poo-poo it's a big problem and what, do we have English in here somewhere? All right, so we, I want to go to the NIV. And I'll show you. You got four, five, six, seven. And we, I'm telling you, a child can see this and see that there's a problem. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Uh oh, wait a second. Twelve. Wait a second. It goes from 11. There's nothing there. There's an A in parentheses. That's the Word of God. That's what you're going to tell new Christians. 
new believers. That's what you're going to tell them right there. You're going to tell them there is no verse 11. It's invisible. You have an invisible verse left for you to imagine or left for you to trust somebody else to tell you what supposed to be there or not there and then I mean you have to follow this thought through are these numbers inspired of God they and I'm gonna tell you they absolutely are absolutely you're giving credit to man for what God has done are you insane are you out of your mind? Are you out of your cotton picking mind? Acts 13, God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. The second psalm. So the chapters and the verses and every word in the Bible is from God. You can't say, if you're going to say this is from man, man did this, then, then man's got his dirty hands on the whole thing, and the whole thing's garbage. Really. There's no way God would do this to us. Only man would do that to us. That's a problem. That's a big problem. And you think about what, what they take out, what the NIV take out. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Why is that a problem? Why is that such a huge problem that they had to remove it from their Bible? That, that's, I mean, come on. Now, well, the excuse is, well, we have a manuscript here where that verse is not in that manuscript. So we're not going to put it in there. The problem is there's over 10,000 manuscripts. So which one are you choosing from? Well, you're choosing from the Vatican approved manuscripts. That's it. But you're, you're going even further than that. You're making sure that you're abiding by the copyright laws. You're not even abiding by the manuscripts that you pretend to be translating from. But you'll use that as an excuse for removing verses. That's just brilliant. All right. So it's essentially saying that we don't know what the Word of God is. We're just trying to sell a book, trying to make a little money. That's all they're doing. Meanwhile, the King James Bert, the King James Bible, is the perfect, pure Word of God in the English language. Now. And it seems like this guy is, I suggest the key, KJV. Well, that's great, it, it's, but it's not a version. It's the King James Bible. And the Wycliffe, I don't want to get into that. That's an older English. Uh, and, it, and it's not, I wonder if it's in here. Now, I wouldn't consider it to be perfect. And uh, I would, I'm not going to consider it uh, full of errors like the NIV, but uh, I went, there was a reason why it needed to be purified again because it was still lacking until we came across or until we came upon <clears throat> this perfect translation which is the King James Bible so they got a lot of verses that are worded very similar but different that's not a problem that's not the issue uh, we'd have to get into uh, looking at some other verses here um, it, it, it's interesting to see these worded differently but saying the same thing no question about it and so when I first started <clears throat> uh, when I first became a believer and I started reading the Bible I read all these different Bible versions and I thought it was helpful to read different 
uh, versions to see the same thing being said in a different way. The problem is when uh, you got one version contradicting another version. And then of course in the NIV it contradicts itself. Right, I, so I guess, you know, I might as well, since I'm making the point, I might as well show something. Um, so we can go to, uh, you know, the one that I always go to, Jesus says, Think not that I've come to bring peace on earth, nay, but rather division. Right? Oh, what? I, I thought... What? I don't know the Bible. I really don't. I need to read more. Sometimes I wonder if I'm making stuff up. Suppose ye that I come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. Now that word division is critical. I mean, you could go to... Here. You could go to... Um, Oh, uh, am I doing this right? I'm not, I'm not, am I? A man's foe shall be they of their own house. A man's foe shall be they of his own household. Jesus is talking about the division he's going to set between believer and unbeliever, between the saved and the unsaved. And he's saying a man's foes are going to be they of his own house. He's come to bring division, division between the saved and the unsaved, those that are of God and those that are of the devil. And the enemies are going to be all around you. Foes are going to be all around you. Um, In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. All right. So we see that Jesus is bringing this great division. And he even says... If any man loves his father, son, the love of God is not in them. Right? Uh, I'm not sure. What's that verse here? I'm missing it, man. If he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy, of me, so he's essentially creating the separation, a division between um, the saved and the unsaved. And he is God Almighty. He is who we put first, right? God above all. Now, let's go to. Let's take a walk on the wild side, right? Titus 3.10 A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Alright, so if somebody's a heretic, <clears throat> you know, you, you want to correct them. You correct them once or twice. After that, just reject them. It's pretty simple stuff, right? Now, we got an issue and one of the issues is I can't get an English parallel what's going on here let's go to the NIV and just see what it says there warn a divisive person oh my it's Jesus is divisive is he not Suppose ye that I come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. I am a very divisive person. And that's what he did all throughout his time in this flesh, in this world. He was very divisive, so much so that they had him killed. Now the NIV comes along and says, warn a divisive person once. And then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with Jesus Christ. And really, is that not what it's saying? 
Don't have anything to do with Jesus. He's dis he's divisive. So when you go to your uh, church and there's an issue and if it if it's divisive in any sort of way they will not welcome you in that church that's the reality of the they don't want any conversation they don't want any dialogue they don't want to reason with one another if you're divisive at all if you even bring up this they will not welcome you anymore they do not like to be proven wrong and they don't want to consider hold on a second Where's, how do we get to so I make this argument too that you know it's more than just yeah I'm not even sure why it's coming up with that really Locate tenemos aquí es failure to communicate. Alright, there used to be, there it is. Alright, okay, right, so this is interesting, okay? So I, I showed you that says a man that isn't a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Right? And the NIV Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time, you know, just like Jesus. You gotta warn Jesus, look, Jesus, he keeps stop, knock that off. And then he keeps doing what he's doing, knock that off. Second time. After that, don't have anything to do with Jesus. You may be sure that such people at Jesus are warped and sinful. They are self condemned. I mean, that's uh, really, that's how I'm looking at it, man. Because when you read all about Jesus, you read about all the division that he caused, all the division that you know he stirred up. I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy. Let's do this here. Think about this. Oh, am I gonna find it? Let's see. Oh, generation of vipers how can ye being evil speak good things for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks he's calling these guys generation of vipers ye serpents ye generation of vipers how can ye escape the damnation of hell you telling me that jesus wasn't decisive uh, divisive he was decisive and divisive huh I mean, he was powerful, right? A powerful man who spoke with authority. And the officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Talking about Jesus. Nobody was like Jesus. He had authority and spoke with power, right? And he knew what he was talking about and he was right he's always right right all right so um, to me this is just crazy all right you're making a big deal about warning a divisive person when jesus christ all the whole time has been divisive since really arguably since his birth uh, since baby jesus was born herod set out to kill him or and so he set out to kill and Herod went so far as to kill a bunch of babies. Come on. Alright, so anyway, that's enough. I think. So I just wanted to share this example here. Uh that is, you know, you see this with uh, you know, perhaps I've gone through this. Perhaps you've gone through this. Uh trying to understand is Jesus God Almighty? He has to be, right? Yeah. He is God Almighty. He was in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. So when he prays to the Father, he's praying to God as we also ought to pray to God. 
He showed us the way. He is the perfect example. He leads the way. And all of us that follow him will follow him all the way through eternity. Right? And again, once saved, always saved. You can't lose your salvation. He will never let you go. And nothing can separate you from the love of God. You are saved. You are sanctified. You are sealed unto the day of redemption. So we can be confident of this very thing. That he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ.